Hello, I'm Pamela Delau, one of the co-directors of the Emanuel Music Bach Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the second part of our open rehearsal for Cantata 32. Now we're going to hear from our guest conductor, John Harbison, who will talk about this week's cantata, um, BWV 32, Liebster Jesu Mein Verlangen, and his talk is titled, Family Problems. John has been a part of Emanuel Music from the very beginning, participating in the first cantata performances in 1970. Among the countless contributions he has made to the organization are numerous works written for the ensemble, many conducting appearances, and serving as acting artistic director from 2007 to 2010. John has also recently published a book titled, What Do We Make of Bach? I'm delighted to welcome him for a discussion of this weekend's cantata. Um, after he's done, um, we will have a chance to pose a few questions to John. So please feel free to enter your questions into the live chat. I'm going to speak today about Bach Cantata 23, both about the cantata and its subject matter, and more broadly about how we at Emmanuel and performers around the world prepare to perform pieces which have very distinctive and very important subject matter and require a rather specific kind of preparation. The subject of this cantata, 23, is an important incident from Luke 2, Jesus coming to instruct the elders in the temple. It's fortunate for us that the Bach Institute generally takes place in what we call Christmas break, and when it can proceed under more normal circumstances, the fellows, the students, are here for an extended period in midwinter. Midwinter is, in fact, the time at which two important subjects in the early life of Jesus are bound to come up here at Emmanuel because of the church calendar, which is a determining factor in Bach's compositional process. The church calendar, and in his case, it's a Lutheran calendar, moves through a very distinct cycle following stages of the life of Jesus. And fortunately for us at Emmanuel, each of these winters with the Institute two subjects seem inevitably to come up, both having to do with parents dealing with their children. Now, the child in this case clearly is a very unusual case, as are the parents. But the issues, I think, have appealed to listeners and to general audiences, to works of art, and, and everyone who has any sense of the, uh, the story and the post story of Christmas. The first story is about Jesus going to preach in the temple as a young boy, astounding the elders with his knowledge. Uh, it's, I think, always appealed to uh, graphic artists, musicians, poets. It's a, a coming of age kind of story and a rather sassy one. He's described as very young in our cantata He's sung by a bass, but that is partly a tradition of a, of a long tradition of sacred music. We have to imagine him nevertheless as young. Um, and he performs in such a way that his parents are, are astounded when they encounter him. However, until they do find him, it's a very wonderful and very typical drama of a child who's gone missing. And the drama, drama of the missing child is obviously something which a society knows to the present day 
and is a very peculiar and particular kind of anxiety. In the case of our cantata, the mother who is looking for the child is sung by the soprano, and she's in a state of high ag agitation. The child is a rather, in certain ways, kind of unpleasantly self-sure and teacherly youth. Um, we have to hear him that way in spite of the fact, as I say, that he's being sung by a bass. And he, has, he delivers quite a lot of instruction uh, to the mother at this point. Don't worry so much. I know what I'm doing. The most quoted line is, uh, wist you not that I must be about my father's business. Um, very soon, usually, uh, we encounter another important story of Jesus uh, early days, the wedding at Cana, which is in some ways a branch of the same story. And again, it's appropriate that we have among us often at the Bach Institute a lot of young musicians who will find, uh, I think, a lot of resonance in that story as well, where Jesus goes with his mother to a party. And the first thing that happens is he rather shockingly insults her. Uh, Bach understood this very well, beginning all three cantatas he writes for that Sunday with a really a kind of a lament or a kind of a shocking kind of uh, uh, realization of a break between parent and child. That very uh, tough insult at the beginning of the marriage of Cana is certainly a, a sterner encounter between parent and child than we are dealing with in the temple with Jesus as preacher, but is cut from the same cloth. It appears to it appeals to the same instincts, uh, the same family disengagements, the same willingness or unwillingness to allow a young person to grow and move away. And I think that's one of the reasons that these two stories, which come up, as I say, so often at the Institute, are appealing to uh, many, many generations, of course, down through the years, is that we resonate with them at home. We all have been through, either as children or as parents, uh, the fissures, the stresses, the incomprehensions, the moments when the child is a mystery to the parent. I'm just going to quote a couple lines from the Bible readings, because this is where Bach starts in writing the cantata. He knows he's going to be working for this Sunday and this story, the one I've mentioned. Jesus going to the temple. And he will go to two texts, usually, one uh, in the uh, letters of Paul and one from the Gospels. And in this case, I'll just recall a few of the lines, some of which come in the, up in the cantata. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. They sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance, and when they found him not, they turned back to Jerusalem. So it's a day's journey lost. And in some ways, one of the things that Bach is going to be responding to as he goes to this text is this is a serious dislocation. He's going to characterize his, uh, his mother as in a state of extreme agitation, as in the first movement of this cantata. And he's going to characterize Jesus as a remarkably self-sure and almost, uh, a, a, let's just say, um, let's just say, uh, unpleasantly self-sure gentleman. Um, he's surprised that they worried so much and where often, how often have we heard this, heard this story. They have, it's for them, it's quite a lot of calming down to do when they find him soberly and with great assurance lecturing his elders. Um, this episode is so uh, near in a certain way, not every episode from a Bakhtata is, 
is so easy for us to ab absorb it into our, our own experience, we are not surprised that it seems to be Bach's most valuable composition method to size up the story and to hit on what is for his purposes, both dramatically and even sociologically, the most important things to get across. So that one of the things that will happen in this cantata is you will find the necessity for Jesus to gradually reveal himself as, uh, as something other. Uh, and this happens in the recitative where they finally confront each other and exchange really uh, with a certain kind of comprehension with, to, with each other. Um, and then they are allowed somewhat ritually, but not so uh, unrealistically, to rejoice together, to be relieved that the problem is over. Um, so we could say it's a kind of a standard thing to end a duo cantata with a duet, but here the duet has to be earned piece by piece so that two beings, two very, very unusual beings who have been at odds have a real reason to sing the same music and to sing it with a certain kind of uh, animation and excitement. Now, in assembling these pieces, Bach, we should look back at, at the situation. He is working at the kind of speed of a TV comedy writer working by the two-week deadline in, in Hollywood. He has very little time to be writing most of these pieces. This is from the third year of his Leipzig set of cycles, at the period in which he was working at the greatest uh, intensity and producing the most music. And he chooses for his text uh, a writer that he had been working with very, very early. In fact, some of his very first cantatas were by Johann Christian Lames. Uh, in this particular period, this is his third cantata cycle, he is working six weeks in a row with texts by Lames after quite a, a hiatus from, from this poet. And he is a poet capable of very great poet, poetic uh, sensitivity, but also in a piece like, an early piece like Cantata 199 of Bach, often garish and shocking. Uh, the kind of Baroque art where we see the, uh, the blood pour and the wound open. Um, but here he is working, I think, very sensitively through the story and provides a text which gives Bach a, a really uh, interesting set of opportunities. And what a composer is all about when I sit down to a text is chances. Where can I make something really interesting happen that I might not have done before? I'm going to go just through the sequence of music in, these, in this piece once and describe where I think the composer uh, is coming from on each uh, incident. He's going to start with a, lament, a very big lament for the full orchestration, all the strings, and an oboe. The oboe is a kind of a surrogate echo voice of the soprano, who is singing mostly in the, in, the, in the character of Mary. The oboe is vocally probably the, the instrument closest to the soprano voice and the one perhaps most capable of the kind of detail of, of expression. And you hear in this remarkable opening chorus a, a kind of uh, double image um, this is how this lament sounds from the voice of an instrument and how it sounds from a human voice and how it might sound actually from the person that uttered it. Um, the response is, I think, very uh, richly imagined. First of all, we get a, bi a direct Bible quote, quote, quote where uh, Jesus says, what what are, you, what are you after? What are you thinking about here? Why, why are you worried? Don't you know I have to be about my father's work here? He's impatient and curt and short. 
Um, but he then sings a song in which he essentially is hearing the previous song. That is, he, the main thing he keeps saying all the way through his area is, I hear in this house a troubled spirit. He's hearing not only what the soprano has sung in the first piece, but he's hearing another version of the troubled spirit as played by the solo violin. So he's recapitulating something that happened, and as he sings, a new version of this troubled spirit, which seems still unable to call, calm down, uh, keeps whacking out rather uh, vigorous double stops and trills and kind of gyrating around. And all the way through this piece, the voice of the young man seems to be enjoining the spirit to calm down. It's going to be all right. I've got everything under control. And he sounds very teacherish and and somewhat categor categorical and a little bit like a, a young man who is uh, perhaps over-asserting his authority. Um, then the cantata has to move into a different point of reconciliation. Uh, the characters have to begin to talk to each other or, be, or really be on the same plane as each other. And it happens gradually in what is known as a recitative, that is a kind of more speech-like vocality. Uh, all the strings play, and the soprano has, seems to have realized in the person of Mary who this is, uh, that, uh, who and what this is, really that this is a being of a, an exceptional kind and um, she is uh, going to be, for the rest of her life, trying to absorb. Uh, and there is, at a certain point, uh, a moment where she quotes uh, a psalm, Psalm 84, how beautiful are thy, are thy dwellings, Lord, uh, which is kind of the moment in which she absorbs that she's dealing with something that is not uh, normal, that is not typical, that is not really part of this world. Uh, and one of the things that happens to her as she uh, begins to deal with this is that her voice becomes joyful and in a kind of ululation and in a kind of uh, almost involuntary uh, uh, elaboration. By the end of this recitative, it is established that both parties have begun to understand each other, um, that they can reach a point of singing the same music, which up till this point, they certainly have not. Um, and Bach then provides a duet in which they can use some of the most simple and uh, effective means of un un unity of thought, which is imitation. They simply throw phrases back and forth to each other, something as old as music itself, but here uh, a very special significance, I think, since these, these two cantata heroes have reached a point where throwing these phrases back and forth means a great deal of terrain covered, uh, a great deal achieved. Um, it's interesting to me that these two, the two early episodes in Bach's uh, composition, uh, actually, no, in the church calendar, the ones of December, which is the uh, first, first of all, of course, the the, um, the the present one in the temple, and the soon to follow one in the wedding at Cana. Um, both follow in close to chronological order from the birth of Jesus. There are two more very important incidents in Jesus' early life which come in the church calendar, but at, at, at quite a different point. Um, and it's always been interesting to me that at this point, I'm ready as a congregation member to experience something about the baptism, but it's not going to come here in the church calendar. There's a completely different time of year where uh, the story of the baptism occurs and it centers around John, the wild man from the desert who occupies somehow center stage in the 
in the baptism as a kind of a assertion of, of lineage, of some wilder spirit, of some powerful uh, regeneration of, of the soul. And of course, for Luther, baptism was uh, something extremely serious and, and constant and needing of, of renewal. So that placement in the calendar is probably deliberate and moves this important formative moment in Jesus' life to a different part of the calendar. And then I'm always waiting also around this time, early time of year, for something else which doesn't come, which is the presentation in the temple when the parents take Jesus as a child, very small child to the temple and where he receives the blessing of Simeon. That also has another church day and an extraordinary response from Bach uh, to Cantata 157 and 125. It's extraordinary uh, sense of the significance of this uh, great moment when really Simeon's uh, ratification or his realization that this is, in fact, uh, this day for which he has always waited and he is essentially ratifying the entire belief structure of the whole community. Um, but those two uh, don't come chronologically in the church calendar. They come in their, in their, in their precise, uh, carefully reserved stations and are always reacted to, I think, with the greatest attention by Bach. One of the things I think that is interesting to realize that when we go back to the Bach studio is that these pieces are meant for and were first, well, let's just say they're still meant for and were first composed for very young performers. Um, when the Bach Institute uh, folks assemble here in the winter and are here live and on the scene, I'm always struck by the fact that these singers and players are pretty much the age of most of the first performers. The only real veterans in those groups were the town wind players who were sort of rented for wind parts quite often. Um, oboists were probably being bred right within the, the community of the school. And it is fascinating to me to, to hear each time that the Institute is here, um, the, the re-welding, the, re, the reuniting with very young performers of music which was written for essentially first performers of exactly their age. Um, we veterans who've gone on with this music all through our lives, I think, become more and more aware of this, that this is a music of which, in a way, when the technical issues are solved, sounds most convincing with very young performers. Um, I'm going to say just a little bit about um, the, the one element in this cantata that lacks what I would call verisimilitude, um, a casting issue. Um, I love the literal way that, that Mary is treated here as the grieving parent. Um, Bach does not use a boy uh, to impersonate the part of Jesus or even an adolescent sound. Um, and what he's reacting to there is a very old tradition uh, coming from the passions uh, of, the, of Jesus being associated with this, the authority of the base. Um, to me, this is always something that needs to be addressed in the performance of this piece. Um, that we have to urge the base to think as young and as uh, cantankerous and as, as assertive as a young uh, person. Um, and to try to convince our hearers that in spite of the timbre, that we are listening to a callow youth here and not a, an old sage. A callow youth impersonating an old sage is probably about the best, the best way to describe that. Um, because I am sure the best possible enga engagement with these cantatas is engagement with the stories. Um, all of them are built, built around incidents or attack, attachable to incidents in, uh, in the Bible and thus incidents in real life. And I think in 
as performers go on through many years and performing them, I think one of the most rewarding things is they are never detached from the day. Uh, they are never uh, remote. Um, if you are thinking about the loaves and fishes and you don't think we have poverty and need, uh, think again. I mean, every story is going to have its, uh, its moment to moment relevance somewhere in our lives. And I think that's why uh, the enterprise was so important to Bach, the completion of the cycles, um, and why uh, he very, very uh, determinedly and unflaggingly uh, finished, really, completed, filled out three complete cycles for each church day, um, realizing towards the end of his life that he had about 10 holes and filling those holes with 10 of the best pieces he ever wrote in his entire life. Um, so I would like to just share in closing a few things about how I study these pieces. Um, and I'm just really only speaking for my own method. Not everybody is the same way, but I, I find I, I always have to go back and read the biblical text. I'm interested that there's always a, a text attached from, usually from the letters of Paul, and I'm not always clear on the connection, but today I think I'm pretty clear. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. And of course, what we have in the story is Jesus beginning his life as a teacher. Uh, Jesus as a young rabbi speaking to very experienced people. Um, we also have, uh, as a means of study for these pieces, are many, many, many graphic images of these biblical stories by, our, by great painters throughout this, the century. And one of the things that the previous, my, my good friend Craig Smith, the founder of this Cantata Singers and I shared, was art books back and forth when we wanted to research a given uh, Sunday. And in fact, we've then found a couple of collections which go through the entire Bible incident by incident and find paintings. Um, in this instance, this very story, I found myself looking through actually many, many possibilities. And of course, the painters are educating us because they study this, these subjects very, very deeply themselves. They need every clue they can in order to make what they do as complete and uh, as full of feeling as it should be. Um, and I'll just mention three of the painters I found who are favorites of mine uh, and say just a couple things, because I'm no art critic, but I'll say what, what I would be looking for. Giotto, and it's part of a very grand cycle, and one of the things that you almost cannot uh, forget is the, is the incredible power of the spirit of the empty spaces, the open spaces in Giotto and this, in all of his big cycles. But he is he's interested in the ritual solemnity, the kind of dignity, the incomprehension, I would have to say, of the studious men. Their incredible sobriety and their sort of almost unawareness of, of this other personage who's come among them. Um, the, it's a stillness which, which I think is uh, almost greater than we experience in life. Um, a, a kind of stillness which is, which is emotional and, and mental as well as spatial. Um, Duccio, who I've always found to be the, the most truthful and simple of the chroniclers of the scripture, um, gives us a kind of scrawny adolescent uh, who seems barely aware of his surroundings, equipped only with a certain confidence. Um, and uh, there's something wonderful about Duccio's characters in that they are not heroic very often. 
they're very much people in a landscape um, and living in the moment and are, are, are in problems that we recognize and situations that we, we may understand uh, already quite a bit about. Um, finally, though, Tintoretto I always look at because he is known to be, of all the great painters, the, the most devout student of the detail of the scripture, the one who tries to think deepest into the situation and sometimes comes up with the most radical vision of the subject. And he doesn't fail here. Um, you look through a very strange perspective. The very closest to you are these gigantic figures of the elders who, who are just uh, massive. They're almost like walking statues. And the boy is this dwarfish, by comparison, figure way in the very deep interior of the picture. Of the picture, but he is going about. He is going about his purpose. Um, something about the immensity of uh, his courage and his kind of rabbinical uh, steadiness comes through in the Tintoretto. Um, with, of course, the added, the added benefit to Tintoretto of having found, in looking for this story, another radical perspective, another amazing way of looking, which is, of course, I think the great purpose of his art. Um, Bach, in the same way, I think, in this cantata series, that used to be, people used to say, well, he did this, this was his job. Um, he was, uh, this was what he was supposed to do, and he was, he was paid for it. No, I think Bach, in these stories, is always finding perspectives for his music, uh, setting a new scene, setting some uh, musical vision which he would not have a chance to find without the story. Um, which gets to the one little technical point that interested me a lot in restudying this piece, which is that for years I have performed this piece and looked at the first measure and saw two words about the string parts, the manner of playing. It says, piano e spiccato. And the last is a very familiar word to string, to string players. It specifically means, in recent string playing, that the bow is bouncing. The bow leaves the string. That bothered me tremendously, though the string players would say, as I would say, you know, let's not do that. They said, hey, it's spiccato. It's clear. It's, you know. So I finally looked it up and consulted a friend of mine who, who knows Italian better than I do, and he said, no, no, not at all. Spicare is pronounced distinctly, which is really what I always hoped we would want to hear in those, be in those beautiful string accompanying notes. Pronunciation, but not space. Uh, almost, uh, almost a pedal down effect uh, of, of continuous arpeggiation. So I was rescued, I think, by grammar, at least for these rehearsals, um, to a sound, I hope, at the beginning of this piece, which I feel is much more important to discover than just about anything about the first movement, since it's the one sound that you hear in every movement of the entire piece. Um, piano e spiccato. So I thank you for your attention. I lead, leave you with the thought of piano e spiccato and a consciousness of how much there is to discover, small and large, in these pieces that were written so many hundreds of years ago, written with so much intent and with so much specificity, and with the details that we will never entirely catch up to, even with a lifetime of study. So again, thank you for coming to the Institute in whatever form, and good afternoon. Thank you, John. What a fascinating and really deeply thought presentation. Um, so I'm hoping that we're going to receive some more questions. We do have 
one very good question that I'd love to pose to you now. Um, we have a, a, a viewer who asked, are you thinking about the text in your conducting of the cantata, and how do you prepare the soloist to get into character? Well, we talk a lot about um, the, um, the story, the, the, the words, and really how they address the, the singing. That is, um, in the case, uh, the, I think the very difficult role in this cantata is the bass, because he, he is timbrely a little misleading, and he has to provide a great deal of characterization uh, of, uh, of a youthful kind and of a somewhat uh, uncooperative kind. And uh, I think in discussing just the nature of the requirements, uh, it's almost much more like, I guess, theater or acting than, than just singing. And of course, a lot of singing is, uh, is about finding the characters, mm. I think, even even art song uh, comes down to being able to find yourself in the situation in a certain, in a s a certain role. Um. I was thinking of a, a question as you were speaking. I know that um, there is some evidence that certain of Bach's contemporaries, you know, the, the town council or the people, the religious leadership, were uncomfortable with too much operatic presentation and mm -hmm. your narrative of this cantata sounds very operatic to me really playing out the scene yeah i think there's been a lot of talk down through the years about bach not writing an opera i don't think he was against it i think it was just something that didn't come up but i think another reason he didn't is he had fabulous material uh dramatic material some of it you uh, you know of course well, you know, from being in so many cantatas, you've never experienced anything more dramatic than certain moments in Bach cantatas because the, the, something so momentous is going on that uh, I can't imagine only in an occasional mythological or biblical drama has opera been able to put people into situations which are both dramatic and ethical and incredibly crucial and, 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 and dangerous to the degree that, that these situations are. Um, I think probably the closest thing uh, is, is operatic comedy because of course that gets so close to daily situations. Mm. But, uh, but operatic tragedy needs, it seems to me, I would imagine in box uh, eyes and ears would pretty much have fallen short of many of the situations that he's presented in these cantatas. Yeah, and, and that also um, made me think about the idea of a, a, a sort of a lens through which um, Bach's contemporaries might be looking at this story. We have Mary and we have Jesus, but we also have the soul hearing the words of Jesus from the Bible and sort of playing out the same drama in a, in a kind of a different register. And many of these characters uh, have the amazing opportunity, strange as it is, of being both a character and a soul or a, a certain kind of emotion. It's just trying to, for instance, in the passions to decide who people are singing for. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most interesting, complicated, and it should leave everyone trying to decide it in a state of wonder, because it's never that straightforward. It seems like everyone who sings a solo in one of the passions is 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 functioning in so many characters at once, um, and is certainly always representing the public at the same time, which right. is which is part of this too. I think uh, these cantatas are never. Um, meant to uh, separate the listener from the story. I think that's the reverse. They're supposed to try to uh, make you know, the, the comforting sort of reach to the congregation that they are as much in these stories as anyone. I, and I think that maybe why they're so vivid, because mm -hmm. we are participating. Mm -hmm. We're not just sort of looking at a painting, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question here. Um, what are some other compositions that deal with the 12-year-old Jesus story 
um, by Bach or other composers that especially interest you? Well, there's this fav the favorite one that we do here a lot in, in Manuel is the Schutz, uh, which is the very same text in the same situation, a spectacular piece of music. Uh, and, and their fa father and mother both sing, and the boy is a boy. <laughs> And uh, so it's very literal casting. And the part of the charm of the piece in performance is uh, so delightful to hear the sounds, the exact sounds of the characters. Right. But it also does a few things. It, it, it actually enlarges that into a kind of congregational anthem in, in, in a certain way. And the characters become sort of, uh, of uh, uh, embraced by a larger, gr a larger group at the end of that piece. Mm -hmm. A very touching thing happens in that piece of a sort of congregational uh, enthusiasm for uh, understanding of the story uh, built into the way that the texts are expanded. But it is always really a kick to hear the boy sound like a boy. <laughs> right. it may not be sung by a boy, but that's definitely what Schutz is, is up to there. The child's voice, yeah. 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 Um, and one other thing, speaking of the child's voice, um, you were talking about the youth of the performers that Bach was writing for, mm -hmm. his students, basically, after Indeed. Thomas Kirche. Um, and of course, it's, it's well known that women were not um, allowed to perform in the sacred context in the church at all. So um, what is your opinion? What is your feeling about uh, using a, a boy soprano versus a, an adult woman's voice in these performances? That's that's some momentarily a baffling question because of course I've, done, I've known this piece a long time and it's always been sung by a woman. I always thought, yeah, it's just a woman, but yeah, it was sung by a boy in Leipzig for sure. And the boys were um, as were the actors in Shakespeare's time were were aware when they were in women's roles. Uh, and, and we're obviously going to make some effort to be believable in, in whatever role. Um, it's, but that is an interesting factor because uh, Bach, as we know, uh, had some opportunities to use women singers um, and was obviously interested in that other kind of vocality that you would get from a, from a more ma mature present. Um, but he didn't back away from extending female roles to great depth, even knowing that they were going to be handled by boys. Um, and though there are fewer soprano areas than there are areas for the other voices in Bach and Thomas, but some of the assignments are amazingly boldly etched as mature female expression. And uh, I think as a composer, he needed it. and. Uh, and I'm sure as a teacher, he trusted that he could get a long ways there. Because right. um, we can't, we have to remember that Bach, as his relationship to these pieces in their first performances was also as a teacher. He, he, he was able to s select the docents and the teaching fellows and so forth that were teaching all the performers. And I'm sure eventually him, he himself um, had some role in trying to describe what he, what he was trying to get at. Uh, I'm always, some, I'm sometimes really described, amazed by the deep maternal feeling in a Bach soprano mm. area, mm. which the text is asking for and which he doesn't hold back from. Or something like Schlafe mein Liebster mm. from the Christmas Oratorio, yeah. which is so maternal. Yeah. Um, and and I, we have another question, but I think it's, it's going to the same part of our discussion. When Bach prepared his cantatas, was it his intention that all soprano and alto parts be performed by boys in the Thomas Kirscher choir. Well, that was that was the choir. He, yes. he, I, 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 quite, I, he wasn't. There was no intention available. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I, I must say, I think, um, just as it's always important to know uh, something about this, the sounds uh, of, of what it might have sounded like in that period. No composer that I've ever met is uh, is completely um, uh, bordered by the sound. Mm. Um, 
the sound is the thing that we're most willing to have change. That's, that's a fascinating, and it feels like the beginning of a much larger conversation that, that might have something to do with, you know, composing a piece for a particular artist, say, and mm -hmm. then how that piece takes on a life beyond the, the designated. Right, it's always a help a go, it's, it's an early focus to write for a sp specific person, but I, th I, I think deep, most composers that I know, and I'm certainly one of those that, that quickly adjust, because the, the actual specific sound is way less important than the thought. Um, and, uh, and we know that must be true, because look at all these things we still play from now that were written for Madame Schumann Heinke or whatever, and <laughs> she's not there to perform that anymore. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I don't see any more questions. So if anyone has any questions you want to get in at the very end of this, otherwise I think we're probably ready to wrap up. Um, I'm watching, no? So, um, that was fantastic, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, And thank you, everyone, for your questions and for joining us today. Please tune in via YouTube for tomorrow morning's church service, which will feature a complete performance of our cantata. And later on that afternoon, a presentation by Bach scholar Michael Maul at 4 p.m., preceded at 3 p.m. by our final Bach Institute alumni spotlight with Julia Dawson, mezzo-soprano. All the events from the 2021 Bach Institute are archived on the Emanuel Music YouTube channel for later viewing. After the conclusion of this weekend's Bach Institute events, the Bach Institute continues with offerings throughout the year. Stay tuned for an announcement about our new Bach Cantata Book Club sessions, where you can read and listen to a cantata and then gather for an in-depth discussion of the piece in a small group setting. Other events will be announced in the coming months. Next January, we hope to be able to bring a new group of young musicians together for an intensive workshop on the music of Bach, keeping our tradition going into a new decade.